Welcome, foolish mortals, to the first ever Halloween special on the Monster Maze channel. Today we cover the dark secrets of a small, remote oasis. A place that in the actual game isn't really all that dark and scary to be honest. No really, it's actually quite a nice place. A tiny, sun-drenched paradise. A place to get a good tan, enjoy yourself a tropical drink and just chillax at the sea. Is that even a word people still use? Chillax? I don't know, I have a hard time keeping up with the trends of vocabulary. Anyway, while this place isn't really all that haunting or scary, we're gonna make it scary. With a haunting soundtrack, dark atmosphere, overanalyzing and overthinking the narrative to fabricate a spooky story, and turn this cutesy little game into the horror fest it was always destined to be. <laughs> The Wind Waker's Great Sea is home to a number of very interesting and mysterious islands. Small leftovers of a time when Hyrule was still a prosperous land, before it was wiped out by the Great Flood set in motion by the gods to deal with Ganondorf's invasion of the kingdom. During the catastrophe, the surviving population fled to the mountaintops to start their lives anew, and stories of the former Hylian capital slowly turned to legend. While exploring the Great Sea, you might have stumbled upon this remote little island known as the Private Oasis. On your first visit, you will quickly discover that the island is someone's private property. You can walk around the premises freely, however, trying to enter the cabana itself results in a disembodied voice rudely commanding you to leave. And that, quote, this cabana belongs to the master, and the master alone. A sign on the front lawn informs you that the house belongs to a certain Mrs. Mary, a teacher who resides on Windfall Island. When we pay her a visit, she seems to be just an ordinary person. A responsible, albeit a bit eccentric woman with a love for education and a strong devotion to spreading joy. After some brief conversations, it becomes clear that besides her life's mission of shaping the minds of the youth on Windfall Island, she also has an obsession with collecting jewelry and in particular, joy pendants butterfly-shaped necklaces which are said to spread joy to those who obtain them. Interestingly enough, these pendants are mostly found in the game's dungeons and in the pockets of Bokoblins, one of the pig-like monsters roaming the land. After receiving her first joy pendant as a birthday gift from some of the kids outside, she states that she is overjoyed, but her cravings don't stop there, and she makes it clear that she'd really like to have 20 of them. If you adhere to her request and gift her an additional 20 joy pendants, wait, hold on, I'm no mathematical genius, but I believe that's 21, Mrs. Mary. What kind of scam are you running here? Anyway, after she receives her 21 joy pendants, she rewards you with the cabana deed. Yes, she trades you 20 joy pendants, which are valued around 20 rupees apiece, for her private island. I seriously need to reconsider the mortgage on my apartment. With the cabana deed now in your possession, you have just become the new owner of the private oasis. Awesome, let us set sail for our new abode and enjoy the luxuries. After presenting the cabana deed at the door, the voice heard from inside the house promptly shifts its tone and is delighted to hear that the place now has a new master. Upon entering the house, we are greeted with a cozy atmosphere. A warm fireplace, expensive pottery sitting on the top shelves, a lawn chair, a bath, not bad. Not bad indeed. But one might notice immediately that you are alone inside the house. So then, whose voice do we keep hearing at the door? As it turns out, this cabana isn't empty. It's occupied by something. Something we cannot see. The room houses a total of three wooden cutouts of a butler. Two mirrored versions and one where the butler is dressed as a maid. Additionally, he is also depicted on both sides of the front door. The servant of this cozy cabin isn't a real person. Now, of course, when playing the game, most of us don't really think any more of it. This is Zelda after all, we're used to some really weird stuff, so whatever. But if we stop and think about this situation, it's actually rather creepy. A lonely cabana in the middle of nowhere, tended to by a disembodied voice which seems to emanate from within, almost as if the house itself is alive. Pair this with the rather unsettling wooden cutouts and the place suddenly feels a lot less serene. Although the voice itself is friendly towards Link once he is deemed a new master, I can't help but shake the feeling that something's always watching you. Imagine taking a bath in this place, with these strange shapes standing in the corner seemingly staring right at you. 
Because of the strangeness of the situation, theories about this butler have suggested that he might actually be a ghost. A spirit who's tied to this particular house, cursed to serve the cabana's master for all eternity. Although the game itself implies that the physical form of the butler is the front door of the abode, there are some things that suggest otherwise. If he really was just a door, as if the aspect of a sentient door wasn't already strange enough, but then what's the purpose of the other cutouts? Secondly, we know for a fact that the butler is able to interact with objects on the island. For instance, after solving one of the slide puzzles on the wall, he will set up a new one for Link to solve. But before doing so, he will ask Link to vacate the cabana so he can set it up. Almost as if he doesn't want Link to see how he does it, out of fear of freaking him out. On top of that, after entering the cabana for the first time, the wooden sign outside on the front lawn changes. Again, the idea of a front door achieving consciousness is already out of the ordinary, but the fact that it can manipulate the environment suggests that the door and the cutouts are simply stand-ins, a way to personify this otherworldly servant. But if you thought the mystery ended here, you are mistaken. This rabbit hole goes much further, and by rabbit hole I mean the one found inside the fireplace. On the ceiling of the cabana we find a large lever or switch, which we can trigger with the grappling hook. Doing so will douse the flames of the fireplace and reveal an entrance to the cabana's basement. Once we enter we see that this place is quite the opposite of the cozy atmosphere found above. Cold grey walls, the floor flooded with water up to ankle's height, rats scouring around and drain pipes spaced alongside the walls, hinting that this is some sort of a sewer system. Upon exploring further, however, we find that this place seems to serve as something more than just a sewer. There are switches that open various gates, ladders leading down deeper into the ground, and tight crawl spaces snaking through the inner structure. Some rooms have no rhyme or reason, frequent dead ends, rooms filled with nothing more than just some pottery, and tunnels which loop back to the same location. Not only is this place a maze, but it's big much bigger than the cabana itself, and seems to stretch across and down the entire mountain peak the house sits upon. If this really was just a sewer, then it's one hell of an overkill for such a small island inhabited by only one resident. But this place has more in store for us than just rats though. This quote unquote sewer goes down deep. So deep in fact that we eventually start seeing different layers of the earth, and even the fossilized remains of long dead shellfish buried deep inside the rocks. But that's not all. Something else is lurking deep underground, waiting for us. If we drop down one of the holes, we are greeted by two redads who reside in this small underground chamber. Okay, real talk by the way, despite the fact that I was already around 16 years old when I played this game, this must have been one of the biggest jump scares of any Zelda game I've ever played. You see, I visited this location pretty early on in the game and at that point I didn't even know redads were going to be in the game, not to mention the awful sound they make when they lock eyes with you. Up until then, the game had been nothing but a light-hearted little adventure, and I didn't imagine this game would have anything to offer in terms of disturbing elements like the ones found in Ocarina of Time or Majora's Mask. Now, I'm pretty sure this is recognizable for a lot of you veteran Zelda players out there. As you might know, in every 3D Zelda game prior to Breath of the Wild, fall damage could be mitigated by holding the control stick forward, causing Link to roll. This is a very useful way to avoid unnecessary damage, so as a Zelda player, you are inclined to always hold forward when jumping down. It's kind of been burned into your memory. So I did just that. I dropped down the hole, rolled forward right into the lap of one of these monstrosities who immediately started screeching. I don't remember my exact reaction back then, but I'm pretty sure there's still a hole in the ceiling of my parents' old house somewhere. Anyway, back to the story. Now, what in Tingle's name and all that is holy are two reanimated corpses doing in the basement of a remote oasis? As Zelda Wiki states correctly, they mainly appear in the Earth Temple, as well as the Ghost Ship, the Savage Labyrinth, Ganon's Tower, and unusually in the sewer tunnels of the private oasis. Unusually is right. All the other locations mentioned make sense when it comes to housing readads. They are either places infested by Ganondorf's influence, a test for the hero, or in the case of the ghost ship, some sort of a cursed place with a supernatural presence. 
If we manage to get past the Redads and venture further into the final stretch of the sewers, we get a clue as to why these monsters may reside here. In the final room we find sort of an altar, two decorative pillars with the same kind of swirl pattern we find in the Earth Temple, and two pedestals, one with the symbol of the Wind's Requiem and the other with the symbol of the Triforce. Conducting the Wind's Requiem will reveal a chest, with either a Triforce piece or in the case of the original on the GameCube, a chart leading to the Triforce piece. I think the fact that we find a piece of the holy relic here suggests that this place wasn't meant to serve as a sewer, but rather as a hiding spot for a piece of the Triforce of Courage. And the Redads may have been placed here on purpose as a protection, waiting for an unexpected visitor to venture into their domain, to prevent the Triforce piece from falling into the hands of the unworthy. Now, some may suggest that the Redads have simply been Ganondorf's doing, but I find that hard to believe. If we take some inspiration from Zeltic's ideas about this topic, it becomes obvious that Ganondorf isn't the only one capable of creating Redads. In fact, in the case of the ones found in the Earth Temple, it's undeniable that the Redads have resided here long before Ganondorf invaded this holy site. Proof of this lies within the fact that the giant statue inside the central mirror chamber unmistakably resembles a giant Redad. And Zeltic makes a strong case that it wasn't Ganondorf, but rather the royal family with the assistance of the Sheikah who placed the undead here to act as guardians for the temple. And it makes sense, the Hylians built the temple after all. It used to be a sacred place of worship where the Sage of Earth would pray to uphold the Master Sword's power to seal the darkness. The former Sage of Earth, Loruto, states that she offered her prayers here for over an age, but was killed by Ganondorf when he broke free from his seal. This would mean that the Earth Temple, including the giant statue of the Redead, were built long before the Great Flood and likely soon after the events of Ocarina of Time. Furthermore, the King of Red Lion states that after the Hero of Time departed from the Land of Hyrule, which describes the events of Link getting sent back seven years into the Child Branch of the Timeline, the Triforce of Courage departed from the Hero and split into eight pieces which were hidden across the land. By that definition, the sewers underneath the cabana were also built long before the Great Flood, and it's likely that the cabana itself was built on top of it a long time after. The reason why I think this is because the architecture of the cabana itself has a very strong resemblance to the houses found on Outset Island, Link's hometown, which wasn't founded until the people of Hyrule fled to the mountaintops in order to survive the Great Flood. It's quite obvious that the original builder slash owner of the cabana knew about the existence of the underground maze, and may have even known what was down there. But instead of sealing the entrance completely, they hid it away behind a secret entrance inside the fireplace. With that in mind, could the mysterious ghostly butler be the original owner of the cabana, who devoted himself to protecting the secret lurking beneath his house, even in death? It would explain why he's so intent on keeping trespassers off the property. However, as not to draw suspicion of this lone, empty oasis, the cabana must have a living inhabitant, a master for the butler to serve. Which brings us back to Mrs. Mary. It's obvious that she isn't the first to own the cabana. When receiving the cabana deed, the game remarks that the deed itself looks old. Mrs. Mary herself cannot be more than 40, maybe 50 years old. And her statue in the gallery states that she's been a teacher on Windfall for the past 20 years. It's unknown if Mary actually knows about the basement, but she must at least know about the ghostly butler, something she never talks about to Link. Although she hides behind a persona of a joyful, eccentric teacher with a love for kids, Mrs. Mary is definitely hiding secrets. Nobody on Windfall Island knows that she owns the cabana. And I mean nobody. This is evident from one of the photographs found in Lenzo's personal gallery. He states that when he was younger, he used to travel the Great Seas to take pictures of interesting locations. Some of his pictures include the ghost ship, one of the Triangle Island statues, the Forsaken Fortress, Outset Island, and the cabana. When asking Lenzo about the photograph, he says that he is certain that this is someone's private cabana, meaning he doesn't know who it belongs to. Not only that, but Mrs. Mary lets it slip on certain occasions that she is absolutely loaded with cash. We all know full well that being a teacher isn't exactly the most well-paid job in the world. So how did she get to be so incredibly rich? And why would she hide her fortunes from the rest of Windfall, including the fact that she owns her own private oasis? Some people on Windfall speculate and gossip about it, but they seem to be oblivious otherwise. Even to Link, Mrs. Mary never discloses how and why she came into possession of her fortune. What is she hiding? 
I mean, she seems pretty eager to just hand off her property to Link for some pendants worth a mere 400 rupees in total. She claims it's because she is tired of traveling and wants to spend her remaining days on Windfall, but just giving it away like that seems a bit odd. Either she really has no more incentive to visit the oasis, or she's passing some kind of burden to someone else. Riches usually don't come for free. I mean, we've seen that happen in Twilight Princess, where Giovanni sold his soul for a great fortune. The cabana deed itself translates to the following. Villa land entitlement. Admit ownership. Marry. Admit ownership, huh? As in, sign here. You're literally making a deal. Also note that the term admit and own are not the same. To admit something means being allowed to enter, which is by no means having rightful possession. The cabana doesn't really belong to Mrs. Mary. It never has. It belongs to an entity which has watched over this island for who knows how long. But the cabana must have a master. It could explain why Mrs. Mary is so obsessed with collecting joy pendants in particular. Perhaps she is trying to remedy something darker. Something attached to her, following her. She paid a hefty price for her life of riches and luxury. She wanted to move on and live on Windfall Island. But the cabana kept calling her. Unable to escape from her responsibility, she eventually found a young, new candidate to satisfy the cabana. Or she just endlessly solved the sliding puzzle inside the cabana, which the butler pays you handsomely for. Rinse and repeat. 